Hey everyone, this is Dr. Mikhail Rashik of Merogenomics making another quick video update on yet another very interesting variant of SARS-CoV-2 virus because for the first time I was able to come across scientific evidence describing a recombinant variant which is a combination between Delta and the Omicron or the aka Delta Cron. So before we get there, I wanted to just let you know Stick around until the end of the video and you'll be able to find out how you can get free tickets to our upcoming COVID-19 Q&A event. So let's get started. Let's share the paper itself and we're going to go through this. So there's the paper and the link to the paper where you can find this. And let's jump into the first figure. Here it is. And on the very top right there, what we see is basically the breakdown of the genes found within the genome of SARS-CoV-2 virus. There's the spike protein right there. And right below that in panel B is you can see how the Omicron and the Delta variant were found to recombine. So in green, you see the Delta variant. In orange, you see the Omicron variant. And in between those two, you can see how these two variants have recombined together to create a new variant. So you can see that almost entire spike protein from the Omicron was uptaken by the Delta variant. And now that's how the Delta Cron was formed. So basically the Delta Cron that was found by these authors, and this has been observed in multiple different countries, is mostly Delta variant with just a spike protein of the Omicron. How did they uh, were able to show this? They were sequencing the DNA of the virus and specifically they used very special type of sequencing called long read sequencing, which allows the authors to read very long nucleotide sequences of the virus, which allowed them to be able to determine with very high level of accuracy that indeed this was the genome of the virus and as far as I understand, this might be the very first recombinant virus proven in existence in such way. Many different recombinant variants have been observed already throughout this pandemic. Clearly, none of them have really taken over. We don't know whether this one will take over. So don't worry, don't panic. There is no point of being afraid of it. I'm making, I'm making this video so that uh, I can stoke your curiosity about the, this rather than um, for us to be afraid of this variant. We don't know anything really about it uh, as to how infectious it might be, but we'll, we'll talk about it to, uh, to some degree in a moment. We're going to go to the next figure, and this is really the figure that I actually wanted to show you the most, and why I decided to cover this paper is because this figure itself shows the isolation of the virus. And in, in many of the comments that I get on my YouTube videos, I often get a comment, hey, how can you talk about this virus if the virus has never been isolated? And I usually respond is, well, well what do you mean by isolated? Because the virus clearly is frequently isolated in, in different scientific laboratories. And this publication shows it right here. So what we see here on the left-hand side right here are cells that were not infected with the virus, so the cells are intact. And on this side right here, on the right-hand side in panel B, we see cells that were infected with an isolate taken up from the sample of a patient. And you can see cells are being disrupted, they're, they're broken up by the virus. And at the bottom in panel C is an actual photograph of this virus from this specific culture. So yes, in order to be able to isolate the virus, you do have to culture it. That's how viruses propagate. They need to go inside cells in order to hijack the mechanism of these cells. And that's how the virus will be duplicated and how it grows. So you do need to isolate it from a bacterial culture. And right in panel C, you see an actual photograph of this particular recombinant or the Delta Cron, which as far as these authors we're commenting is the very first example of isolation of a recombinant virus uh, during this pandemic. 
So I thought this was very interesting. So next time anyone tells you, hey, the virus has never been isolated, well, here you have perfect example with photographs of how this virus might be isolated. So we're going to go to the final photograph of this paper. And we're going to get into the structure of this new recombinant variant. So we're going to fo focus first on panel A and B. In panel A, what we see is a backbone structure of the spike protein. So please recall that when proteins are made, they are made of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. And basically, amino acids are put together in a long chain. So it's a very long chain of amino acids that then these amino acids start to interact with each other through either their electrical charge or because of their shape. And they form in the end through this interaction, a three-dimensional structure. And this is what you see in panel A, but it only shows you the backbone as if you were to trace how these, this chain of amino acids travels through space. So basically that's how you end up with a three-dimensional shape. You do not see amino acids themselves on, on this image in panel A with an exception of mutants, mutations that, that are specific to this uh, Omicron uh, recombinant variant. And they are shown in these blue blobs. So these blue blobs you see are basically the three-dimensional shape of the amino acids on top of the backbone, which is shown here in gray. And the reason why we often just show the backbone is to, for sake of simplicity, and that's also what we see in panel B, but in panel B, what you see is an overlay of this amino acid backbone of the spike protein of both the Omicron as well as the recombinant. And this is a good example of why we want this simplicity is because right away you can see that these proteins, spike proteins between the Omicron and the Delta Cron, they're, they're basically identical. The only difference you can see to some degree is in this little corner right there, there's an extra few amino acids found in the Delta Cron that are not present in, in the Omicron. And as a consequence, they will cause greater three-dimensional shape in this corner of the protein. And you will be able to see that right away. I'll show you that in a moment. So we're going to open a new tab so I can show you this final part of the figure, which is the electric uh, surface of the spike protein. So recall in video number 34, I believe, I introduced the concept of, of the fact that proteins, including spike protein, they have electric charge on, on their surface. So all amino acids carry some charge to them. And what you see here is a spike protein as shown where you find different types of electric charge on its surface. So in blue, you have positive charge and in red, you have negative charge. And in white, you basically have amino acids of the spike protein that are not charged. So you can see the vast majority of the spike protein is charged. Now, what you see here is a single spike protein. You need three of these identical single spike proteins to come together in order to form the final structure that you will see, which is the club, like a club that you see on the surface of the virus. So you only see a monomer here. You need three of these or a formation of a trimer in order to form the final spike protein. And you can see the monomer, it looks like a letter Y. And if you take three of, the, of these, then this Y shape at the top, they come together to make that bulky head on, on top of the spike protein that we have become so familiar with. And in, on the left-hand side, you see the, the Delta version of the spike protein monomer. In the middle is the Omicron. And you can see there are some differences. So one of the major differences between the Omicron and the Delta is the fact that the receptor binding domain, which is the part of the spike protein required to interact with the ACE2 receptor, the receptor found on the surface of our human cells, this is the, the part of the spike protein that will interact with that ACE2 receptor to gain entry into our cells. And you can see 
that it is more blue, meaning it has become more positively charged over time. And this is how it's believed that it might have been able to become more infectious because it's more complementary now to the electric charge of the ACE2 receptor, while at the same time, it might have become less pathogenic because it no longer can get inside as easily into, into the cells. However, you can see nucleotide domain has also been, been changing uh, through evolution between Delta and the Omicron. And you can see that Omicron nuc and entram on the domain right here is more negatively charged. We do not know yet what the consequences of that might be because I have, or at least I do not know because I haven't seen literature discussing this. But here in the very right hand side is now the recombinant version or, or the delta cron. And you can see the receptor binding domain is still very similar as what we have seen previously in the Omicron. So that still might retain that same infectivity as Omicron, but perhaps continue to be as mild as Omicron. However, now you see a difference in the entrimonal domain. And that might also be significant. Here's the little extra surface area because delta cron has extra amino acids. So as a consequence, the outcome of delta cron is that N-terminal domain becomes more positive and has a greater surface area, three-dimensional surface area. Now, why that might be important, and the authors comment on this, is that it might help delta cron to become even more infectious as well, meaning more people might get infected, but still the variant might be very, very mild. And the reason why they suggested that, because recall from video number 24, I did talk about that this N-terminal domain might be interacting with sugar molecules that are found on top of our human cells. So that's normal. It has nothing to do with your sugar consumption. Sugar molecules decorate many different molecules in our body, and they do decorate cell surfaces as well. And Electrically, these sugar molecules are negatively charged. So in fact, when we get infected with the virus, the first interaction between the virus and our cells might not be the re ACE2 receptor. It might be interaction with those negatively charged sugar molecules on top of our cells through this N-terminal domain. And because this N-terminal domain is now even larger in size and more positively charged, the authors postulate that perhaps this might help Delta Crohn become more infectious than Omicron itself. But we will not be able to know that until if this happens, until this variant were to become dominant and we can actually determine what are the clinical impacts of such a variant. But at the moment, there's very few people that have been found to be infected with this variant as far as we understand it's the first time we were able to study this information where a recombinant variant was proven through genome sequencing and they were able to show that both the genome sequence isolated from the patient sample was identical to the genome sequence of the variant that was subsequently cultured and i just showed you a photograph of that and that's how they were able to to say unequivocally, this is a new recombinant version of two variants coming together, forming a Delta Crohn. How does this happen? Well, a person would have to be infected with two variants at the same time. And yes, that can happen. Recall that before Omicron took over the world, it started to take over the world while previously Delta ruled the world. So there was an overlap in time where there were similar quantities of both the Delta and Omicron together at the same time in certain geographical locations. And that could allow certain individuals to be infected with both variants at the same time. And if such two variants inhabit the same cell at the same time, they could recombine. And here we see a first demonstration of that. So I thought this was really interesting and I really wanted to share this interesting science with you. Again, strictly to satisfy curiosity and nothing more. All right, if you made it this far, please um, please uh, stick around to find out how you can get these tickets. So the first 10 people to subscribe to our newsletter, 
uh, we'll, we'll send you free tickets to our next COVID Q&A event. These are a lot of fun. Basically, the way it works is we answer top 10 questions that we pull from, from the comments on YouTube videos. And then it's open mic where the, anyone in the audience can ask any questions they want. And we basically chat or, or post a comment, etc. So basically, it's a conversation where we all can share ideas as well. And um, the, the link to the newsletter subscription you'll find in the description below. So please check it out. They're a lot of fun. If you like this information, give us a like, share the video, subscribe to the channel. You know how it works. This is how we grow. And we're looking forward to making another installment in the near future. Bye for now, everyone.